Hello and welcome to the 51st episode of Adam Alonzi's podcast. Tonight we'll be talking with Jason Swanson, co-founder of the fastest growing company in America. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, Jason. Hello, Adam. Pleasure to have you on the show. And I'm eager to discuss supply chains because they are fascinating. They're one of those invisible movers of the world that most of us take for granted. We just find a package on our doorstep and think it arrived there by magic. When I first started getting into this, I had thought there was all sorts of supercomputers figuring all sorts of things out. There's definitely a lot to be desired in the technology of supply chain, and we're trying to change that. Swan Leap, according to the brochure, generates savings by ignoring old routing rules, selecting the cheapest carrier and mean, which I assumed was how it's always been done. I mean, that should be the old rule, but apparently not. <laughs> well, what seems to happen in, in companies is there's a lot of humans manually creating these rules when really algorithms and uh, pricing and dates should be calculated to figure out how to ship something. Um, we run into a surprising number of companies um, that are trying to intelligently optimize with hundreds of rules, but they really don't need to do that because the a computer should be able to figure out what is the best route on a per shipment basis. But a lot of the software that is used to power huge companies is not doing that in real time. It's it's sort of using a rules that you would think you should calculate on a per shipment basis, but they're kind of grouping shipments together and then they're not necessarily getting the prices in real time before they're even deciding where it's supposed to go and how it's supposed to get there in a certain amount of time. So we go into companies and they say, well, here's all our rules. We need to make sure that all these rules are there. And then we find out after looking at these rules that really, they really don't need these rules anymore. And the computer should just figure out what the best route is for the lowest price. So it's sort of another example of taking a lot of data, allowing a computer to sift through it, and coming up with solutions humans typically wouldn't. Yeah, it is, it is, you have to look at the pricing contracts in the truckload market. The market rate is changing constantly. Um, so even if you had certain pricing contracts in play, you might not know that that is the best price you can actually get. And it gets complicated to put all these things together to make sure you're getting the cheapest price. And a lot of companies and logistics departments are so busy just trying to get the physical goods from point A to point B, they're not using all available options to get the cheapest price on a per shipment basis. So this means that the software is doing very exhausting work, finding these different options. Yeah, a lot of the times the companies know there's inefficiencies or they may not even know there's inefficiencies. And we start them off uh, just by using the software. And the software keeps track of what happened on every shipment and the price of every possible uh, mode and carrier that it could have gone. So we have all that data 
Um, so then after a few months, we can look back and see, we can run simulations on what maybe they should have done instead of what they've actually done and um, help them see the cost savings that they can achieve. What's the backbone of your software? Is it pretty standard, a pretty standard toolkit of data analytics? Is there any deep learning involved? Neural nets, you know, simple neural nets. Yeah, uh, we use uh, Node.js on Google Cloud. Um, it's kind of the backend framework of our software. And we basically store every single possible thing about a shipment. And then we take that data and we are starting to perfect our, how the system runs simulations, um, getting into neural net and trying to figure out more in real time how to analyze a supply chain as quickly as possible. What we're trying to do is immediately see kind of the signature of your supply chain and we want to as fast as possible have the system learn um, the intricacies of the different um, routes that your shipments are going, what different modes, what different carriers, and then fill out the gaps on where you should be saving money. And this is something that could be useful to businesses of all sizes, I'd imagine. Every single business has to ship something. Even a law firm has to ship documents around. So it's kind of this, this just gigantic industry and every business should be able to do this with their shipping. You know, computers are at the point where uh, Swanley should be able to provide them software. It doesn't matter how big the company is. It should be able to look at your supply chain, no matter how big or small, and then route each shipment according to the cheapest method that will get there in the exact time you need it. As I will mention in, in the introduction to this podcast, your company has experienced explosive growth. And I'm curious about how exactly you figure out how to charge clients, because I suspect that both large and small companies have approached you and have adopted your service. Yeah, really, we find a lot of the other technology out there has huge gaps in it. So we usually identify some type of problem in a company um, and we can then provide a wide a variety of services that can help them unify their technology in one place. So they might use five different software programs um, and after getting Swanly, they don't have to use those five anymore. Um, so we usually want to get in the door with a company. Our pricing is competitive based on the size and the freight spend of the company. And it depends on the dynamics is if there's an opportunity to provide additional services for them or not. So really we're trying to be as cost effective as possible and um, one of the challenges is a lot of software out there maybe says they can do something like mode shopping or real-time um, rating of shipments, but then it really doesn't. So we also compete on that front. So it really is, we really have to look at each company situation. Um, and since there's so much savings involved, um, we can be cheaper than normal because we know we're going to get the savings numbers that will help them actually save money. And that helps explain your success. A lot of happy customers. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate goal is to provide automation to a company and automate things that they necessarily didn't think could be automated. 
at the same time saving them money. We can pretty much walk into any company, detect where they can save money, and the net result is automation and saving money. Um, there's a lot of old um, style running of these logistics departments. Um, they might be suspicious of technology. They might think you can't automate things. They might um, think they have good contracts in place. Um, but if they do, they should bring on our technology because we can audit all of that. Like if they actually do have good contracts, that's great because then you can prove it. A, a lot of a lot of uh, individuals in the supply chain departments they seem to get kind of scared of actually proving that they are actually have good contracts. We sort of make it a win-win situation. Um, we want to make the logistics department look good. We want to give them the tools to show the other parts of the company um, that they're doing the best they can in the logistics um, market. It's pretty uh, cutthroat out there um, in terms of something called capacity. Um, there's basically general rate increases of four, five, six percent, way above inflation at the moment. So every year, um, companies are getting letters from the carriers um, that move their freight saying, well, b based on the market, we have to increase all your rates 6%. And that's happening year after year. So a lot of logistics departments are under pressure to figure this out. And it definitely is something that is overlooked in a lot of companies because simply they're not their expertise doesn't necessarily lie in logistics. Well, 6% is nothing to spit at. But I guess optimization is one of those words that gets thrown around so much and frequently goes undelivered that maybe some people are suspicious of it. However, it sounds like you've accumulated an awful lot of evidence in favor of your software. You briefly alluded to the assisted bidding tool that saved one company $360,000 in a year. How does that work? Some companies are limited by the amount of carriers that they can have come in their facility because they only have so many dock doors. So they can't necessarily bring in a lot of carriers. Um, so finding the right carriers that will, that you can negotiate good contracts with um, can be challenging. Um, so a lot of companies maybe just stick with um, a couple of carriers or maybe a broker um, that will make sure that they're moving their freight correctly in the correct dock doors so they don't have trucks coming to the dock doors and just sitting there because they can't get into the door. They can't actually get in there to have the freight loaded. So with our technology, we're able to um, analyze those patterns and automatically send shipments out to bid to certain carriers so they can use more of the market rate instead of contracted rates. Uh, contracted truckload rates are up to about 20% of what the market could currently um, bear at that moment. So if a company is basically automatically sending shipments out to bid, they need to get the right carriers in there so they can uh, manage their dock doors effectively. So moving a little more out there into the ether of business philosophy, does Swan Leap take any inspiration from schools of thought like Lean, Six Sigma, Kanban, etc. at Infinitum? 
So we use um, Agile and XP. We do pair programming. So anybody working on code is working in pairs. We are rapidly getting feedback from our clients. Um, we don't use uh, um, the more accepted waterfall approach because how many times has anybody seen an IT project fail? And well, why exactly is it failing? You know, what does a deadline mean? How do you design um, the architecture of something before you start doing it? Um, so we use a very strong um, Agile and XP programming approach to resolve some of these issues. And part of the success of Swan Leap is actually going to the client sites and seeing how they're using software, um, rapidly delivering software. We had a large company that had over 100 locations in the United States and um, other competitor systems said it would take uh, maybe a year to a year and a half to get implemented. And we got them online in 60 days. So the rapid approach to producing software in an agile and pair programming sense has definitely served Swan Leap well. Something that I frequently ask of entrepreneurs who come on the show, usually ask it before anything else, but we're doing things in a topsy-turvy manner today, is what inspired you and continues to inspire you? So what really inspires me is automating processes that humans are doing that they really don't need to do anymore. I want humanity to get to the next level. Part of the thing we did in the beginning is um, how do you actually teach somebody programming? Um, I was able to take um, several individuals who had strong logic skills um, and help them become programmers very fast. And um, I think that's a theme of where the future is heading. If you look at the past you know, 70 or so years that programmers have actually been a thing, the world is, is, needs more and more programmers. So how do you put pressure on the world to have more skilled labor instead of unskilled, unskilled labor? And how do you make programming easier to do? How do you make it easier to ship things? How do you get um, robots in there instead of humans so humans can actually do higher and advanced, more advanced things with their brains? Um, so um, coming back to supply chain, I've been able to actually learn how humans learn so that we can rapidly um, have a mutual understanding with the developers how shipping works and how software works and how to develop software as fast as possible, as well as providing software that automates previously more mindless tasks or inefficient tasks build a future where there's not so much friction and there's not so much, you know, human potential being wasted. I think that's a noble goal. On the other hand, I also think that idle hands are the devil's workshop. <laughs> so you primarily see automation as a good thing. And I'm reminded of something J.G. Baldred said, botching his name, I'm sure, that his great concern about the future was that we would all be bored to death. Well, if you, most people have some type of hobbies. Most people um, have a, they're kind of looking for 
their passion. Um, I guess I'm somebody who doesn't get bored very easily because I go out looking for these things. The question is what happens when a machine is able to do fairly intellectual work I mean, I think we can entertain ourselves. We do a pretty good job of it, but there's also a human need for purpose and meaning. Well, if you're in a logistics department and you're sitting there making a bunch of rules that a computer can do much better than you, is that really a real purpose that you're doing in your work? Um, it, that goes to the question of what is purposeful? Um, you know, some people like taking walks in the woods and looking at, at nature. Some people like pushing the boundaries of what we can do with computers. Some people like relaxing on the beach. There's all sorts of things that um, we as humans do that it's hard to actually justify a particular purpose that one has. I would say that relaxing on the beach or walking in the woods can both be reduced to utilitarian terms. They're reducing your risk of a massive heart attack. So, <laughs> it's true. So maybe we need more of that. Maybe while you can do, you can track your shipments from your phone while you're on the beach instead of in an office calling around. I'll give you some baseline statistics. Um, FedEx and UPS, those companies are, are the companies that come to mind when more consumers think about shipping that's only like five percent of shipping that happens um, another 15 percent is um, freight trucks that have multiple companies stuff on them a whole 80 percent of shipping at least in the united states is truckload which has just one company stuff in it and a lot of those truckloads are humans making phone calls back and forth or sending emails manually. And that just doesn't need to happen anymore. The future is really coming, whether we like it or not, especially with um, driverless trucks. How do we enable companies to get there? If we think of it in 100 years, this stuff's inevitable. It's not going to stop, so. Right, and my impression was that FedEx and UPS were pretty much the only game in town aside from, you know, the big trucks you see on the highway. Well, we learn something new every day. Don't you folks? I'm talking to you people, you the audience for once. I'm breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> I like it. Well, Jasmine recommended an anime to me where they do that a lot. It's just seeping into my real life. But returning to serious matters. When you mention someone finding meaning from directing machines, I don't doubt that at all. And people became attached to their Tamagotchis which weren't particularly intelligent or realistic. So I foresee people extracting a lot of meaning from their virtual assistants, virtual selves, and their children. And their children might happen to be computer programs. 
Yeah, I think a, a lot of this is humans are evolving. And you could have said the same things 100 years ago. Oh, no, with these cars, people are not going to be able to enjoy walking around from place to place. Or, well, people like taking care of their horses, and now they, they're going to have a car, and a car is a machine. They're not going to be able to have that emotional connection with their transportation. Uh, but I think humans are just constantly moving forward. And as humans, we evolve to whatever the future brings us. Well, if you, if you actually look at the statistics of driverless vehicles, um, you're actually much safer with them as a whole. Yeah, but people don't pay attention to statistics. Although insurance companies do, so I imagine that eventually they'll be mandatory. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, for once the insurance companies might be the heroes. Um, another topic of kind of bringing automation to the world is a lot of countries, not just the United States, they're a bit behind in technology. So a lot of global companies, they want to get other countries, especially in South America, online with some of the latest technologies, uh, but it either gets a bit cost prohibitive or um, the labor is cheap enough uh, but the problem is there's a huge tracking problem um, kind of globally. It's not easy to track exactly where shipments are internally in countries in South America. And one of the, one of the interesting things is as mobile phones get more popular, you have the, a scenario where in some areas they have like the latest technology. You know, most people might have a mobile phone in their pocket. Um, but they might still be using um, Excel spreadsheets to do their freight planning. So you've got this uneven uh, technology culture, and it's kind of what we want to bridge to, to give some of these other countries in South America software for a much lower price. Um, that's more equivalent to the phones that they have in their pocket instead of Excel spreadsheets that they still have to use to manage their freight. So there's the humanitarian component to it, which is cool. And I'm sure you've read about Walmart's experiments with blockchain. I believe they did it on pork and dates or some other somewhat exotic fruit. Has your company considered experimenting with it or leave that to other folks? Definitely. Um, I think a lot in the cryptocurrency world, I think the supply chain example is used quite often, um, but companies really haven't figured out how to get it in place yet there's a high barrier to entry in terms of supply chains are constantly moving physical goods from company to company, but you sort of have to have those companies want to use that technology. So you get into this chicken or the egg thing. Um, but as Swan Leap helps more and more companies track their shipments, I think shipment tracking and order tracking uh, will naturally lend itself to opportunities where we can add in things like smart contracts um, to our customers' supply chains. The article I read on it in Fortune, and I think also in Cointelegraph, made it sound more or less like a resounding success and so much so that Tyson and 
McCormick, nine other companies. And I know, for instance, I edited and polished the white paper, white papers for a couple ICO that we're working on supply chains for one was for fossil fuels. And one of the big issues with fossil fuels in developing nations in particular is loss in different areas. So their scheme is to test how much is flowing at different portions to make sure no one is stealing it or the other party isn't trying to jip the other. So there's the hardware software integration. Yeah, there's definitely a huge problem with um, proof of deliveries out there because companies are selling goods to, to other companies um, and companies are not going to pay for goods unless they get them first. Um, so actually proving that they got them first is definitely a huge thing. There's a sort of famous case between Chinese company and an American one about the definition of a chicken. And I haven't read it all, but yeah, I think this is why we need clear terms, smart contracts, and one day robots that can tell us what a chicken really is without going into the whole medieval debate about universals. And Swanlieb wants to enable companies any company to get online with at least the latest technology um, because that is the bridge to getting some, some of these really exciting um, cryptocurrency and smart contract technologies online. If a company um, is 20 years behind in their technology in the first place, how can we get them to use smart contracts we need to first get them to use the latest technology that exists today. And then it's a, just a hop, skip, and a jump um, to start using smart contracts. So the more companies that we can get online with more of 2008 software, the more chance we have to succeed at implementing some of the next generation technologies that these companies are currently experimenting with then you guys have seriously considered adopting Ethereum or Hyperledger, GoChain, something like that, incorporating it into your routine practices. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's awesome. And people love to see that because blockchain has become such a horrible buzzword that it almost makes me nauseous to read it. <laughs> it's true. There's all sorts of controversy in the cryptocurrency world. And, I mean, that's coming from someone who likes it. He's very excited <laughs> about it. Great. It's almost compelling me to, I mean, there's DLT, distributed ledger technology, so that's one synonym. We need at least three more synonyms. <laughs> sure. So besides AI and blockchain, what else do you foresee Swan Leap getting into? unifying the software that a lot of companies use. Um, a lot of companies have an ERP, which is an enterprise um, resource planning software that controls their entire company. And then um, that software talks to a warehouse management system, a WMS, and um, then they, then they either have the warehouse management system basically print the labels or go to another software that basically prints labels. Um, we're basically trying to make it easy as, as easy as possible to get order data from your ERP or warehouse management software um, so you can actually get visibility into your supply chain. A lot of companies that we go to can't even necessarily export their shipping data. Um, so we want to sort of bridge the gap into getting visibility onto their data so people can actually see their data. Once they can actually see their data and um, can run analytics on it, 
um, mm -hmm. then they can start to see all of the unsolved problems and pricing issues that are happening. And we can get companies excited to start bringing more um, shipping technology online. Uh, we recently talked to a large uh, warehouse management system company, and they were kind of asking, like, what is even a, a TMS, a transportation management system? Uh, because it gets blurry. Um, and I think a lot of the transportation management systems out there are more kind of, quote, dumb systems where they're not trying to use AI to figure out your supply chain. They're not trying to um, give you analytics on your supply chain. They're really um, just kind of label makers, but Swan Leap wants to change that into um, more dynamic software that then leads into these um, next generation technologies. So it's a lot of kind of bridging is kind of what we're able to do and unifying multiple software systems together that were previously disconnected. I think one of the great lessons to be learned from Swan Lake is that even though something may apparently work, if we examine it a little bit more closely, we see that it's stuck in the Stone Ages. That is a very elegant way of putting it. Um, it that's, you know, when I first uh, met my business partner, um, he showed me these software systems and said, hey, look at this system. It cost this company a quarter of a million dollars. And I was like, oh my goodness. Why does this look like it's from 1997? Um, so there's definitely a lot of Stone Age software out there that is marketing as if they're using the latest technology because it's hard for executives to tell the difference sometimes. Um, the shipping industry is hard. It's hard to figure out exactly what's going on in it. It's hard to figure out what to do. It's hard to fit how it's hard to understand what knowledge is real and what isn't. It's hard to figure out um, if people are actually experts in it or not. Um, so it's a lot of trying to show um, as easy as possible what a better future could be like um, in terms of a company's shipping processes and visibility into their own um, processes and shipping and contracts. And it's just, it's very surprising how um, Stone Age a lot of this is. Um, I worked in a couple of neuroscience labs where we had to use technology to figure out the molecular mechanisms of memory. I worked in another biotechnology company that was um, getting laboratories into the cloud so they could more rapidly um, perform data analysis. And the stuff that's flying in the shipping industry would not fly in biotechnology. So I want to bring the biotechnology level technology into the shipping industry. Yeah, I think most every industry has its acceptable level of nonsense. And maybe in some it's easier to pretend to be an expert than others. That's probably why Dilbert is such a funny <laughs> cartoon. He's poking fun at management. Do you have any management philosophies, human resource strategies? I think my number one is a lot of people kind of work jobs just to work jobs. And uh, Swan Leap wants to find people who are passionate about one thing um, in particular, and you want to really help your employees and check in with them and give them a workplace where 
they go home and feel good about working there. They want to, um, you know, feel some sense of accomplishment and that they can specialize in, in something. And so um, with the development team um, that I run, um, it's a very collabor collaborative environment, especially with pair programming. Um, it's very social. If you go to a lot of other development teams, you know, everybody's in their cubicle um, working away. And of course, you know, they talk to each other and they'll, they'll have meetings. Uh, but Swan Leap is another level of human social interaction in terms of development because you're constantly talking to another human being while you're programming. And I think that brings us back to what somebody a human and that's interacting with other humans. Um, so there's definitely a lot more human interaction and social interaction in Swan Leap than other companies and development teams. Yeah, and even though they didn't really need to do a study on it, we know that people tend to behave differently even when there's just a mirror in front of them because they feel like they're being watched. To frame it in slightly darker terms, my apologies. Yeah, you could say that as an allegory for what's happening in the logistics industry. There's not necessarily enough watching, so... You know, somebody can go through their whole career in the logistics industry and be charismatic and end up costing a company millions upon millions of dollars that they did not need to spend a certain way. What are your hobbies? So I like playing Japanese role-playing games, games like Final Fantasy. What you just said reminds me of the first video game I played, which was called Crystallis. And it was actually about that. It was about humans making so much technology that you know, the world went into a nuclear apocalypse. But ironically, a cyborg wakes up in a cave and then ends up saving the world again from technology.